Pro-Life Talk. Real World Answers. This is Life Report. Welcome to Life Report, Pro-Life Talk, Real World Answers. I'm your host, Josh Brom. I'm here with Liz Goddard and Right to Life of Central California's newest staff person. Yes. Gabby Veers, who is a college student at Fresno City. She's also the president of the Pro-Life Club, the Students for Life Club at Fresno City. Um, Gabby's had a lot of JFA experience with us, Justice for All, for those of you who are, haven't heard every single show that we do. We talk, we talk about <laughs> JFA every other episode or more. Uh, so Gabby's been with us doing campus outreaches a mm-hmm. lot, and we were so impressed with her that we hired her. She also is a homeschool speech and debate champion and coach. I don't know if you could Say champion. Oh, coach. <laughs> competitor would be a good word. In the Skill coach, competitor. Yeah. <laughs> and I was going to ask you about that. And then thing to, to correct we're someone. Doing, on. We're being careful with our words. Okay, so coach. You got to be good to be a coach, right? I mean, maybe not a champion, but at least yeah, be good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so what, what was cool about Gabby is over the last few years, she's been learning, and I, I, I don't think you'd say the journey's over, but you've been learning how to take those skills that you learned in homeschool debate and yeah. how do you how can you use them to have a good dialogue not just have a really good debate like yeah. you can't I, I love you said something uh, about uh, you can't like be at a college campus on a protest person be like <laughs> let me get out like all my notes Hello, <laughs> and my timer my prep time get yeah. out a table start laying out piles yeah. of evidence how do your cross-examinations go when you're on college campuses <laughs> they walk away <laughs> So we don't oh, want yeah, to do no. that. <laughs> so, uh, so you've been learning how to how to you know teach other homeschool speech and debate mm-hmm. students how to come and have actual like actual like effective dialogues on on campus. So we went and hired her, and so now she's going to be on the show for a while. Andrew yes. is awesome, but got so busy that he just could not be here every single time. Mm-hmm. We'll still, if you're a big Andrew fan, you'll see him a little <laughs> bit more later on the season. But um, we're excited about having Gabby on. Want to real quick before we get to our topic. Uh, If you want to get more Life Report, you should go to our website, prolifepodcast.net. We're putting a lot of content there. I know it's hard for you to believe if you've been, uh, (laughs) you know, had any access to our website before, but we've gotten really good lately at not only publishing Life Report on a weekly basis, 10 out of 13 weeks of the year. (laughs) Or 10 out of 13 weeks of the third, you know, like for whatever. Okay. So 10 out of 13 weeks, we have a new episode. (laughs) Does this make sense at all? I think Usually so. there's a new episode every week. That's all I'm trying to there say. There you go. At like, you know, whatever percentage of, of that would be. And then, but we're also putting up new stuff. We're putting up a lot of speech audio. Yes. Um, if you want little excerpts from me speaking, I'm putting those up. And then listener mail. We're totally doing listener mail differently now. <laughs> if you send us listener mail or, or emails or voicemails, uh, we're not going to do listener mail episodes of Life Report. I'm just going to sit in the studio with a webcam and <laughs> record responses to them and get them up quickly. So no longer yes. will you wait an hour I'm sorry an, an hour, hour a, a year. year it was usually a year <laughs> this is, is gonna awesome. be a good show I can't talk straight okay let's get to our topic awesome. um, okay if you are pro-life then you probably remember the article that came out in February of of this year on it called after birth abortion why should the baby live it was written mm-hmm. in the Journal of Medical Ethics a journal this is where this kind of thing is discussed but right. this was the first time the public really, I think, found out in in mass that philosophers sometimes talk about pro-infanticide arguments and kind of weigh arguments pro and against infanticide. Right. And so there was a lot of hullabaloo about this article. Sure. And, um, and so we've, you know, I kind of didn't think we we're going to do a Life Report episode on it. And then I just, we started getting fan requests to talk about it. So I want to talk about it, but not just what's in the article, but how we should respond and maybe more importantly, how pro-lifers should have responded. So why don't we first, and you guys haven't talked yet, so I want to get <laughs> jumped to you guys. Tell me, yeah. do you remember, what, what are your recollections of when this came out, how the pro-life community responded to it? I would say in horror <laughs> yeah. is a good way to put I it. There was, um, the idea of somebody outright saying that it's okay to kill an infant after they're born right. was was taken in just that attitude. How in the world can you say this? That's horrible. These people are evil. There's no absolute way that anyone in the world should believe this. Very, just very um, passionate mm-hmm. um, response to this radical concept. Gabby. 
Yeah, I think there was a lot of that. And I was also encouraged by some of the thoughtful response that I saw, at least with some of my friends on Facebook and from some of the podcasts I listened to. Um, people who were like, okay, see, this is the point we've been trying to make all <laughs> right. along. Yeah. This right. is where your your position will eventually lead. And yeah, we can give specific. Greg Kokel, a stand to reason, mm-hmm. talked about this on his radio show. Um, he, he he talked about, you know, this is what happens when you right. decide right. to throw away the idea that human beings ha- are valuable because of the kind of thing they are. Right. Our mm-hmm. friends at Life Training Institute did a podcast and talked about it. I wrote two articles about it. And um, and so he, when I, it's, I, I felt like I had a different I felt like I saw something different and maybe so this is this might be me being like all um, negatively skewed or maybe I just have different pro-life people coming up on my news feed on Facebook yeah. but I felt like I saw a lot of people or and bloggers emoting about how awful infanticide is but not okay. really responding to the arguments outside of obviously Greg and LTI. Obviously those guys would. So what did that look like to you? What did you see people saying? It looked like just people being angry. That okay. how like yeah. how dare you yeah. write anything that could you know like infanticide is awful. Blah. Like that was it. Mm. Like that right. was the that mm. was the end of it. And I would agree with you. I think that's something very similar to what I saw, but also um, a hatred and a horror. Hmm. To that, I like what you said there. And a lot I think of, true. I mean, I saw a lot of people stereotyping then the other side hmm. as mm. being, you know, this proves they're baby killers. This, wow. this proves that they're evil. That you know, only a mind corrupted by Satan could possibly <laughs> ever think that it's okay to kill a wonderful, beautiful baby right. in your arms. Right. Which you know, there's a lot of truth to that statement. And but a few people went even farther than that and sent death threats. To these authors, and and at all. yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, happens, there's, there's, yeah. Now there's extreme, there's there's wackos uh, yeah. on the extremes of every of every issue. I know that, but that still really bothers me well, because I'm in this help. movement. It doesn't and help. I thought Dr. Peter Singer actually wrote a brilliant post about this article. I don't think <laughs> I've necessarily ever had common ground with Peter now, Singer give before. Give us the background of who okay, Peter Dr. Peter Singer, Singer is. bioethics professor at Princeton University. He is yes. he, he has been the most famous and, and you, you often referenced by pro life people as, mm-hmm. as someone who has written yeah. um, pro infanticide arguments. He is a yeah. very very consistent philosopher, um, and he believes certain things about where v- your value you as a person comes from and he mm-hmm. believes that fetuses do not have that nor do newborns right and mm-hmm. so he bites the bullet he doesn't just say oh we're just gonna draw this arbitrary line at birth no he says mm-hmm. no the, you know to be consistent you know less uh, up to 30 days maybe it should be okay to to kill newborns it's, but he but and that's not new he's he and michael Tooley he, yeah, have written that for 30 years um, but then this article comes out and everyone went crazy. But Peter Singer wrote this brilliant post. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is just one of the things that he said that has to do with what we're talking about. Right. He said, the moral status of newborn infants is a real issue, and it is proper for academic journals to publish articles that, like this one, discuss it in a serious and well-reasoned manner. People who wish to defend the traditional view of the sanctity of all human life should respond to the author's arguments, not by mere abuse. And it's ironic that some seem to defend the sanctity of human life by threatening to kill those who question it. <laughs> no, and, he's right. <laughs> and I'm that like, I'm ironic. completely with you. Yeah. <laughs> and then he went on to say, yes. opponents of abortion ought to welcome articles arguing that there is no real difference of moral status between the fetus and the newborn because they've been arguing that themselves for yes. many years. Yes. Their problem apparently is that most of them, and this is this is true, this is staggeringly bad, but this is what he said. He said their problem apparently, pro-lifers, is that most of them do not know how to argue you against anyone who agrees with them that the fetus and newborn infant have the same moral status, but then denies that merely existing as an innocent hu- living human being is enough to give a being a right to life. If mm-hmm. opponents of abortion believe they can win this debate by reason and argument rather than by threats and intimidation, they have some work to do. I completely agree. I agree, but it's a very natural response when somebody agrees with something that goes so opposite the moral intuitions that you have Mm -hmm. it's like somebody comes up to you and tries to tell you that child abuse is okay or that Mm -hmm. rape is okay and Mm -hmm. if you don't have an understanding of how they came to that position or how they hold it it's very i mean it's very intuitive to be like what do you mean how can you think that you must be insane and think about it it happens in our marriages all the time 
somebody our marriages or what are you saying well, about my marriage I'm not I have married an honest <laughs> marriage <laughs> but think about the last time that you had a dispute with Hannah or you know anyone else in the audience you had a dispute with your spouse and you just didn't understand where they're coming from it's easy to to get get emotional about it and just start saying how can you think that yeah. instead and of And I'm saying that's the question we've got to ask. Let's actually yeah. ask the question like you know, I, I'm on Honestly a, ask the question. Honestly ask <laughs> yes. that's right. Uh, on, yes. Like read the article like would be one idea. Because <laughs> I think a lot of people yeah. responded to it by hearing what other pro-lifers said about it and didn't even read the It's, it's like a six, five page article. It's not a very long As, as far as a journal easy goes, read. this is super easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not, not hard to read. Pages. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess an example of what I'm saying is, you know, I'm on a, a, a Facebook d- discussion group on abortion, and I, uh, someone, had, one of the pro-choice people, had posted this question of like, you know, do you ever think the bodily rights arguments will go away? And I'm not going to get into what bodily rights arguments are. We can't do that right <laughs> now. If you go to prolifepodcast.net, look at bodily rights. There's a bunch of them. It's great. Yeah. Um, but like, all there were pro-choice people saying, oh no, they're never going to go away. They're untouchable. And so I responded mm-hmm. by saying. If you have any respect for me as a thinker, which they do, and you know that I actually am aware of bodily rights arguments, in fact, I've done a lot of studying on them, and I still think abortion should be illegal, then shouldn't that give you, like, pause? Like, maybe I'm wrong, but shouldn't you at least have pause before saying that they're Mm -hmm. untouchable? Maybe there's an argument you haven't heard before, and maybe, you know, we'll get into that. Um, I think that should be our response. When someone says something Mm -hmm. crazy, and to them, me saying that bodily rights argument, maybe there's a counter-argument, like, is crazy (laughs) to them. But if right. they're coming from people that are, you know, maybe you know, smart enough to be writing in journals, then let's at least take a look at the argument. Yeah. Agreed. Um, mm-hmm. I think, I, I, and the other thing else, before we get into the article, I think Singer makes a good point, and, and this is something that we have been saying for a long time. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, pro-choice arguments, mm-hmm. if taken consistently, mm-hmm. automatically end up affirming infanticide. Not always. The person right. could make a bodily rights argument, and that would mm-hmm. only apply to unborn fetuses and right. would not apply to newborn right. infants, right? But if someone's making, like, a personhood argument, they're saying that the, that the fetus is not a person because mm-hmm. of, you know, X, Y, or Z, a lot of times if you start asking, well, what about the newborn? We call that trotting out a toddler. Right. We find, well, okay, well, that disqualifies newborns, too, or maybe even toddlers. Yeah. And so this is, once again, this is what we've been saying for a long time. It's just that they wrote it in a journal, and when people read it, and people freaked out. Right. So let's talk about what they wrote. What, uh, does someone, would someone besides me like to give a summary of, of basically what the articles, what, what the authors are saying in this, in this article? I think we've nominated Josh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Go right ahead. Here's basically uh, Dr. Jub- Jubilini and Minerva, doctors Jubilini and Minerva believe mm-hmm. that uh, you are not valuable simply because you're human, right? right. Uh, mm-hmm. Christians believe that human beings are valuable because they're made in the image of God. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got other people that make pro-life arguments about us having, you know, like a future like ours right. argument like right. Don Marquis uh, gives. Uh, and Jubilee and Ian Minerva basically say being human is not special. Same thing Peter Singer and Michael Tooley have been saying. Like, that's a speciesist mm-hmm. argument. You're saying that humans are special but other animals are not. Saying your, argue, your value does not come from being human. Your value right. comes from having certain capacities to have desires, um, desires for alternative situations. So I, I, I've copied just kind of the most important paragraph of this entire article. You want to understand where they're coming from? Right. This is what they say. They said both a fetus and a newborn certainly are human beings mm-hmm. and potential persons. And we would disagree. I'm not. Right. I'm, I, I would mm-hmm. not say it's a this is person, their but they, This is their mm-hmm. argument. Both a fetus and newborn certainly are human beings, potential persons, but neither is a person in the sense of subject of a moral right to life. So let's pause. Let's just make sure, I want to make sure everyone's following. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't generally like to differentiate between humans and persons. Right. When I say human being, I mean a human with basic rights. With basic rights. And basic value. But they're making a distinction. That's right. They're saying that there's a difference between just being human and when you become a person. Right. And that would be when you become someone who has moral value. That's Mm -hmm. right. And they they wouldn't even say human with certain kind of value. They would just, they would say like an entity that has Mm -hmm. this strong moral value not to be killed or whatever. Okay. So they say, then they define what they, what what person means to them. We take person to mean an individual who is capable Mm -hmm. 
We take person to mean an individual who is capable of attributing to her own existence some, at least, basic value such that being deprived of this existence represents a loss to her. So basically, is what they're saying that they believe that in order to be a person, you have to essentially be able to see yourself as being alive and desiring to live. You have to have basic like desires. A, you have okay. to at least have the capacity. doesn't mean you have to be fulfilling them necessarily. Right. But you have to have the capacity for them. Whereas some pro-life philosophers would say, well, the unborn have the inherent natural capacity to do those things. But they say mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. You've got to currently have right. the capacity, whether you're fulfilling it or not, to and have, humans have that. Humans have that ability to recognize themselves over time is kind of another way some people have put it at about what age well see i mean now now you get into defining like yeah, at what point that's sentience a little bit different. Begins. something like something pretty broad is fine, i'll, I'll, but I'll give the purpose... you oh, the, the very basic answer if you define sentience and i've got a speech audio on prolifepodcast.net right. on this responding to speciesism or something like that basically you can define it different ways if you want ex- the, like the super extreme definition would be you got to recognize yourself in a mirror which right. happens mm-hmm. at like 18 months after birth. Right. right so you got 18 months okay. is one or or you know you've got people who say you got to you know peter singer has like a five part definition that's too long for me to uh, properly, you know, mm-hmm. like I can't just paraphrase it, but part of it has to be you've got to know that you are an individual entity right. that will exist over a period of time. Plus, you got to be able to do a few other things. But then some people would say, oh, you just got to be minimally aware of the outside world. Okay. okay, well, late-term fetuses can do that, and, and newborns can do all that. Right. So kind of, so depending on where they, you know, if you're talking to someone who believes it's all about sentience, you got to find out what they mean. So for this article, yes, they're definitely drawing the line some period of time after, after birth. birth. Yeah. Okay. And they don't ever define exactly when that begins. Right. right. They keep it vague. Right. Um, but they're definitely. But they, they basically say in here is certainly after a few days or a few weeks after okay. birth. Okay. Okay. So that's least. kind of where they're. Albeit, maybe they consider safely drawing the line somewhere. Yeah, yeah. A like few for days example, they could birth. have in this article said sure. we're like w- they could have gone a step farther than what they did. They mm-hmm. could have said we believe that we should just draw the line at two weeks, and it would be a threshold argument. Basically, they, and this right. is what Peter Singer does. Peter Singer does not think you're a person at 30 days, but he basically says since we know it's after 30 days, right. but we don't know exactly when, let's just draw the line at 30 days, which like plain it's safe, you know, and because mm, and, sure. we know we're not killing a person if it's at 30 days, it's probably more like six months. It's right around when you're really talking about when that kind of sentience begins. Okay. So give or take a month so, or two. So basically what people need to take away from this right. is that no newborn human meets this That's requirement correct. of okay. having a right. at least a basic um, knowledge and desire for life. Yeah, I don't think new. I don't think like we should like. I could see someone being like, "Well, you know, we have uh, n- n- newborns want to eat." Or that, that was my question: is when it says desires, what are they? classifying as desires because a newborn would have the desire right. to eat or to sleep or for its mom or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something, something more than just, than just eating and sleeping. Some some desire to to live, um, that, that they're able to describe to, some basic value to themselves. Just wanting to eat is not describing basic value to yourself. To make, okay. they, they do indicate to make some aims or appreciate your own life. And right. so, I mean, we're, we're talking about something that's after birth. Right. And so that that's what makes their argument... Um, a little radical is the fact that they accept that right. and they decide to still use it as their premise for what a person yeah, is. Yeah, like I, and I don't know if I'd use the word radical, but it certainly makes it different. This is this is okay. on the outlier. Uh, since yeah. most people have this presupposition, even most atheists have a right. presupposition that humans are just valuable kind of beings. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, well, no. Or at least say, that I you don't can't know the, kill a baby. How many have actually thought? Most atheists I talk to are against infanticide. And and I don't know exactly. They may how not they know why. That. They might but not know they why. Have an intuition. But, but they have an intuition. Right. Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you. So the most important part of this article is where they define harm, because they're basically saying you're a person if you have if you ascribe this value to yourself, you don't want to be harmed. So then they well, define what harm means. And they're saying it's wrong to harm persons. That's right. And mm-hmm. so it, what they're essentially saying is that if you're not a person, if you're just a potential person, then then in causing your termination, we're not actually causing you harm. Right. Because it's like you're not planting a seed. Right. You know, you're, it's not a tree yet, so you haven't destroyed it. As some people have used that argument. Right. And and so in looking at this distinctly, defining what, what harm is, is key to their argument. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so uh, I'm just going to summarize their definition of harm because the, where they define harm is a little bit confusing the way they worded it. So I, I just, I, my summary is you can be harmed. This is their view that you can be mm-hmm. harmed by an act now if. You're currently able to value the different situation you would have enjoyed, but you can also be harmed by an act at the point in the future when you're able to value the different situation. And because the newborn killed in an afterbirth abortion never valued his existence, he's never harmed. So I've I've come up with actually no. First, let's go to you. You had a thought about harm, and you had an example you wanted to, to test out uh, that might right. attack that death. Because if you if you demonstrate that their definition of harm is wrong, I think the entire article pretty much collapses. And, the, and the that's the thing. Collapses. For the most part, the premises that they put forward about the fetus and the and the um, newborn baby being on the same moral plane is right. exactly what pro-lifers have been saying for years. Right. Um, so it follows. It makes sense. Um, but I think that there is a weak point in their definition of harm. One of the I, I was impressed that they actually used the example of, you know, you could be harmed by someone um, someone taking your winning lottery ticket right. and they go and they, you know, they, they've harmed you. They've taken what's rightfully yours. Even if you yours, never find out about it. Um, if you never find out about it. Right. Um, but they, they indicate that that's not an actual harm if that person isn't the type of being that could have appreciated having a winning lottery ticket. That's right. They're saying if you're a potential person and someone takes your winning lottery ticket, well, you know, even if you'd been given that lottery ticket, you wouldn't have been able to appreciate it. Um, Unless you grew old enough to appreciate right. it. Because Right. Because at that point, you're not able to comprehend it. Um, and in thinking about that, you know, they're saying if you're not in the situation where you mm-hmm. have the physical capability to um, comprehend something, right. that you're not really harmed by it. At um, least in, at least not at that point. At least right. not at that point. So one of the things that I, that I thought of was, you know, maybe a challenging counterexample is what about somebody who's who's unconscious or, you know, better yet, somebody who's in, who's in a coma, mm-hmm. you know, someone who may or may not ever. Is this a temporary coma or a permanent coma? Maybe we don't know. Okay, maybe right. it's a permanent coma. Okay. Um, but if somebody's in a coma, and we don't necessarily know when they're going to snap out of it and, and have a, an appreciation for their life again. I mean, th- it's happened in the past that people have been under anesthesia and they've been groped or they've been molested in some way. Right. They're not aware of it. Um, if someone's in a coma, we don't know if they ever will be aware of that harm, but are they still harmed? Right. Most if people somebody, say they've been harmed. Right. If somebody's in a coma and they end up not waking up from that coma, but they've been sexually molested while in that coma, is that a harm? And it's going to be, and it would be even more obvious to the person you're talking to if you call, if you say it's a temporary coma. Um, I sure. think, I think you might sure. end up in this gray area with someone where it's like, ah, oh, permanent coma. Not sure if they ever, you know, it would be almost, it'd be, you know, you can ask, you know, did, does someone after they've died, if they've, if they're molested by the, the, the mortician, yeah, you know, so then, you know, so if you call, if you, I, I, I would, I would use a temporary coma example and I've used that. And I think, mm-hmm. I think that helps. Um, right. I think uh, what my my example to try to kind of undermine the definition of harm is um, is take thalidomide. Yeah. If uh, if if let's say the mom to get in thalidomide is is the anti nausea drug that if you take it it'll cause severe birth defects. Right. Imagine a mother gets a hold of it anyway and takes them and causes her baby to be born without arms and legs. That baby, when it's born, is not aware of other people having arms and legs, is not right. aware of a desire. So they would have to say that that the baby was not harmed until he or she reached an age where they were able to desire arms and legs. They, if, right. When they looked around and saw mm-hmm. everyone else with arms and legs and looked down and saw no arms and legs and said, I wish I had those. That's the point. They would say that that entity has been harmed. And I think clearly that entity was harmed right. either when the mom took thalidomide or when the thalidomide actually had a chemical right. effect on the child. I think that I, I think that's a counterintuitive notion that you're you know the kid's not harmed until he's you know five years old or whatever and wants arms and legs. See, I I almost got a different feeling when I was reading the article because it almost seemed to me like they were saying um, if a woman takes drugs that will harm her baby, hmm. um, yes, that is a harm, but the harm occurs then if the baby um, lives, if the fetus lives, and then reaches personhood. Yeah, it's not, it's not how I read it. No, I, I read okay. It, I, I mean, I could... Because be, they were, I've looked at this to a me, lot, it, se- it seemed like they were saying it's only 
it only isn't a harm if the um, the fetus then dies. If, 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 it, if it dies that. before reaching that mm-hmm. age, because they have a part where they say, or, or the harm happens at the point where the child has those desires. So uh, e- either way, we would say it's. Ca- I mean, it's counterintuitive. I mean, let's say let's say it was that way. Then then you would say the child where you you know let's say the mom takes the thalidomide um, or uh, and then the baby dies in a very very late term miscarriage or like a stillbirth and they say well the mom never harmed the child by taking thalidomide early in the pregnancy it's like no no no. you harmed the child by taking thalidomide knowingly taking thalidomide causing it to not have to not grow arms and legs the fact that the baby died later in a stillbirth would you know is a, is a is a different situation either way i think the definition of harm does not work we have to actually wrap up the episode now. I have way more I want to say about it, but we're almost <laughs> out of time. So here's here's what I want pro-lifers to do with this. I think this article is the best opportunity for starting dialogue that has happened in the last several years. I think it's less mm, right. helpful now than it was in February because it was all in the news. But if you have pro-choice friends, I would send them a link to you can get this, you can read the article for free online and you can right. go you can find it at prolifepodcast.net. Send it to your pro-choice friend and say, "Hey, I love to I I'd love to understand what you think about this this article and and let's and you could start a dialogue on abortion through this article final thoughts from Liz and Gabby I think that even though this article is extreme to some some extent I don't think it's had the effect that maybe the authors were going for. I think they were trying to normalize or in a way make this acceptable. And I think it's had the opposite effect because when people start to realize that the baby that was just born in their family, that the law protects and that everybody intuitively wants to protect is under attack by the same logic, that's going to backfire and be a a bonus for pro-lifers. Yeah. I don't want to, I I don't want to guess what their intention was, but if their intention was to normalize it, then I I agree. I think probably in the end, I, I, I was glad the article was published in the yeah, sense that yeah. I'm glad people saw it and actually started interacting with these ideas a lot of times for the first time. Um, and time will tell what the net effect was. We here at Life Report want you to be able to take information like this and have good dialogues with, with your pro-choice friends. So please don't let it stop at learning about articles like this or even reading them. Go and take them and use them. Have good conversations with your pro-choice friends. That's our show. Have a great week. You've been watching Life Report, pro-life talk, real world answers. Life Report is produced by Right to Life of Central California. Visit their website at fresnoprolife.org. Join us September 22nd for an interactive pro-life training on turning abortion debates into dialogues, followed by an outreach at Fresno City College. For more information, email kyle at righttolifeca.org. That's kyle at righttolifeca.org.